income. It makes them more vulnerable to poverty and old age. Um, uh, it's not something that our economic system uh, really uh, provides uh, any rewards for. So we, we all say how much we love it and appreciate it, but we don't really uh, put our money where our mouth is. You say that one of your favorite examples of the battle for economists to pay attention to the, the non-market uh, work dates back to a letter that was written back in 1878 by the Association for the Advancement of Women, and they were complaining that the Census Bureau failed to acknowledge the productive value of, of homemaking and, and women as homekeepers. Um, why should we be interested in, in non-market work, and is that changing as there are more... Uh, what we would call feminist economists out there. It, it's definitely changing. It's definitely been uh, uh, a long disagreement. Uh, it's been going on for more than 100 years. Uh, but I think partly because so many women have moved into paid employment now and we're seeing the consequences of the withdrawal of that time from non-market work, we're more, uh, we have a greater appreciation of what, um, uh, what we've been getting all along and what it's worth. And the United States and other industrialized countries are now conducting regular surveys of time use that allow us to actually ask how much time are you devoting to um, taking care of kids, how much time are you devoting to preparing family meals, to doing family shopping, things like that. And so we can actually count that up and ask, well, uh, if you had to pay somebody to do that work uh, instead of doing it yourself, what would it be worth? And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, 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 big chunk of change. I'm curious to know, you know, for centuries women provided the kind of work you just described uh, for free in the home, and now with more of them working outside of the home, we are sending children to daycare centers and, and parents to uh, elder care centers and the like. What has happened? What impact has that had on the quality of care? Well, uh, that's a great question, and I, I think it's an interesting question because the, the, uh, the effects have been somewhat contradictory. I, I think on the whole we provide better care for children and elderly today than we did in the past. And we do it because we're often combining pretty good institutional care with good family care. Um, actually, you know, studies of time use show that when parents put their children in a child care center, they're not reducing that time hour for hour. They're often then coming home at night or on the weekends and putting in um, more time. So in terms of the total amount of attention, uh, attention that, that children are getting, um, they're, they're probably actually uh, better off. Um, but I think it's hard often for individual families to find a good balance between institutional care and family care, and particularly uh, if their job isn't flexible, uh, if they can't take time off from work, if they can't kind of juggle what they need to juggle, uh, then things get stressful and then the quality of care uh, does tend to suffer, and I think um, unnecessarily so, that if we w were a little bit more creative about institutional change, we could help uh, people do a better job. Well, interestingly enough, uh, women have moved into the workforce, but they're still doing predominantly, 46% of the workforce is made up of women. But if you look at particular sectors, um, health care, it's, it's predominantly women. And so they're still doing stereotypically female work. Um, that's changing, but, but what impact does that have on how it's valued, how it's compensated? Yeah. Well, again, you know, there too, it's uh, somewhat contradictory. I think it's... Um, that women's willingness, um, you know, their intrinsic motivation to, to provide care for other people, to go into jobs that are, that are um, basically involve care, it's, it's really good for us. It's helped us maintain the quality of services. And um, as consumers, we really benefit from it a lot. But um, women themselves are penalized. These jobs don't pay very well. Um, they're often not um, adequate to help really support a family, so turnover rates tend to uh, be high, especially in lower paid jobs like child care and elder care. Uh, and so now we're seeing a, a lot of young women in particular uh, who want to move into other jobs because they've recognized that going into care is kind of a dead end uh, economically that will leave them uh, dependent. And I, I think uh, we need to think about that and adjust to that. And it, basically, if we don't improve pay and working conditions in these jobs, we will see a deterioration of quality. But you've also seen women who choose non-traditional uh, fields. Um, for instance, a woman who might operate heavy machinery rather than working as a nurse, she may earn more money, but she's less likely to have a date. Well, uh, <laughs> this is true. I think that there's st still very strong uh, 
cultural norms in our society that tend to penalize uh, women who go into non-traditional kinds of work, but, but those norms are changing, and I think they're likely to continue to change. And I think one of the reasons why the costs of healthcare and education are going up is that women now do have more cultural freedom and flexibility to move into these non-traditional jobs. As it stands right now, women earn 76 cents on the dollar um, doing comparable work as men. And some say that by 2018, if the trend, uh, if women continue to make progress as they are, that should be uh, equal. In other words, they should be earning equal pay for equal work by about 2018. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like that's uh, on the horizon? Uh, I think that's a long way off. And, and I think what, what you see if you unpack that average is that um, you know, women who are not married and don't have kids are pretty much earning exactly what men in, with their same educational credentials and job experience are earning. And a big part of the reason for the pay penalty that women experience is that they are providing care. Uh, and so one question we need to think about as a society is whether we want to continue uh, uh, imposing such a big pay penalty on women for, for providing uh, family care or whether we want to try to create an institutional environment that allows for a better balance between those two sets of, of responsibilities. So how would you go about rewarding that, that non-market work? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, ways that are currently under uh, discussion right now. Uh, paid family leave that would give parents more freedom to take time off from work. Paid uh, sick leave uh, from work. A lot of low-income Americans in particular uh, can't afford to take time off to take care of themselves or a, or a sick family member. Uh, reducing some of the pay penalties for part-time work, uh, moving away from this norm of a 40-hour or 45 or 50-hour week and creating more jobs where people can work uh, 30 hours or 25 hours without uh, being deprived of, of health insurance or other benefits, um, providing better quality uh, child care and elder care services so that people can uh, have more flexibility to uh, uh, you know, reallocate their time. Of so a lot, of, a lot of these things are, are in play right now in, in, in Congress, and I'm actually hopeful that we're going to see some progress in the next uh, couple of years. Part of it, too, though, will be reducing the stigma that's attached to family leave, especially for husbands, for example. Right, but Euro European countries have approached this um, in a very interesting way by providing use-it-or-lose-it provisions. That is, a, a, a father can take time off to uh, st uh, stay at home with a newborn uh, baby or a y young child or, or to, to take care of a, a younger child. And if they don't use that time, they can't transfer it uh, to, their, uh, to their wife. Uh, and uh, one of the things that that's doing is creating more of an incentive for men to do it, and that in turn changes the cultural norm. And, then, and it, takes, it takes time, but I think that's, uh, it's a healthy thing to get underway. Uh, UNICEF just came out with a report that showed that Britain and the United States ranked dead last for the quality of life of, uh, among children in industrialized nations. I think what was most surprising was that there was no consistent relationship between a country's wealth as measured by per capita um, gross d domestic product and a child's quality of life. So yeah. It's really shocking that you know poverty rates in, among children in the U.S. are very high and they uh, have increased in recent years. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, the long-term effects for children are very negative. So, you know, what I try to do as an economist is persuade people that um, child poverty isn't just a moral issue, although it certainly is that. It's also an economic issue that, uh, you know, we have a resource and we're not, um, we're not making the best of it. That if we invested more in the capabilities of our children by reducing poverty, I think it would pay off. In fact, you're more interested in human capabilities than the GDP as a, as a measure of well-being. Well, you know, we live in an economy, a, mo a modern economic system runs on human capital. Um, and it, it costs a lot of money uh, to, uh, <laughs> to create us. <laughs> uh, and it's an investment. And uh, we need really highly educated and and uh, competent individuals to run the increasingly complex technological infrastructure of our economic system. So we really need to see child rearing and education as, as um, economic issues and, and integrate those two parts of the, the um, you know, traditional 
uh, economic view of the world. Well, the Wall Street Journal recently came out with a report that showed that it cost something like $279,000 uh, to raise a child, which is roughly about $16,000 a year. And of course, at the, at the far end, if you have elite experiences, it's as much yeah. as a million dollars to raise a child. Plus, those estimates are just based on what um, consumer expenditures are, and they don't include any valuation time. of time. Right. And if you add in um, the value of the time that parents are providing, I think a, a more reasonable estimate today is probably 25000 a year. And, and you talk about children as a public good. In other words, there are uh, benefits to employees, to taxpayers, to yeah. parents, to all of us of raising the next generation. Yeah. That being the case, that I'm going to steal the, the title of your book, Who Should Pay for the Kids? Who Should Pay for the well, Kids? Well, I think all of us should help pay for the kids because we all have a claim on the earnings of kids. That's what a income tax system is. It says that we're going to tax citizens um, proportionally to their income. If we create, if we raise a generation of citizens that are more productive, then that comes back to us in the future in the form of tax revenues. So uh, all the debt that we're accumulating right now is going to re be repaid uh, by the children that uh, people are out there uh, raising. And this intergenerational accounting really needs to be brought into our understanding of the way that economic system works. There are some four million babies born in the U.S. each year, and, and you talk in, in some of your work about how much more, it's fewer children than in the past, but yeah. how much more we're spending on education, so the inputs are higher. Yep. Um, what are the implications of, of that? Why, why is that an important thing to look at? Well, I think uh, uh, what worries me is that some of us are spending a, a lot of time and energy on those children, and some of us aren't. Um, there's actually a fairly high percentage of, of uh, college-educated women who are not raising kids. There are a lot of men who um, are biological fathers but are not really committing very much time or money to the uh, uh, raising of their own children as a result of divorce and, and child support enforcement problems. So there's a very uneven distribution of the costs of, mm -hmm. of kids. It's born... Uh, Mothers and single mothers in particular uh, are paying um, a very disproportionate share, and yet everybody uh, is getting a claim on the benefits. The Social Security system is, I think, the best example of that, that you're going to get the same uh, Social Security benefit when you retire as somebody else with the same earnings history, and that will be true whether or not you spent half of your income raising three kids um, or not. Interesting. You know, most yeah. people don't think of it. In fact, when they look yeah. at their benefits, they might look at the menu of or the cafeteria of benefits and say, well, wait a second, I don't even have kids, and they, and yeah. they uh, uh, resent paying for some things. Um, yeah, well, I think that's because uh, we still have a way of talking about child rearing as though they were completely private, almost like pets, you know, you, you want one, you got one, you take care of it, it's yours, you know. You wouldn't have it if you, if you didn't find it uh, rewarding. And um, uh, children are not pets. Um, children are, you know, our uh, future, which yeah, is the cliche, right. right? I mean, yeah, it's, it does right. sound so cliche. Yeah, yeah, it's like I think, uh, you know, the British Labour Party has uh, launched this major initiative to reduce child poverty, and and the um, slogan that they have is that children may not uh, make up a very large percentage of our uh, population, but they are a very large percentage of our future. You know, getting back to that UNICEF study, that the countries that were rated highest are in Northern uh, Europe. Um, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark lead the list yeah. in terms of child well-being. What are they doing in those places <laughs> that we're not doing here and in Britain? Well, they have a very good uh, national health system. Uh, everybody in those countries has access to very good health services. They have very good early childhood education and child care that's subsidized uh, by the government. They have paid family leaves from work. Uh, uh, the Netherlands in particular uh, has made real efforts to help parents reduce working hours so they can combine family care uh, with uh, uh, paid care. Um, so th it's not rocket science. The pol you know, it's pretty clear what kind of policies you need to put into place to reduce poverty among children and to uh, improve equality of opportunity. So we should get busy and start adopting some of those policies. You talk about working long hours as being a competitive strategy, but if everyone does it, it sort of loses it, its value. Um, but women and men who devote uh, time to family and uh, community, they, they can't compete. They won't make partner in the law firm, for example. Yeah, that's true. They're in, especially in high-level professional and managerial jobs, um, the demands that are set are kind of what's sometimes um, 
called an ideal worker system that it, it sort of presumes that everybody is available to work 60 hours a week and and if you can't do that then you don't really you're not really committed to the job and it's a kind of a work norm that really does discriminate against uh, parents it's really unhealthy and I think it, in fact a few enlightened firms are recognizing that and trying to discourage that kind of competition it's it's uh, you know maybe gets good results in the short run but in the long run um, I think uh, people who find a better balance between paid employment and, and family and community responsibilities probably end up being better workers. Is there another kind of competition that would be considered healthy? Well, I mean, uh, all, all competitive systems have limits on them to prevent people from getting carried away. You know, every competitive game has a referee. You can't have a football game without an umpire, you know. Uh, the misuse of steroids in sports is a good example of what of how the pressure to compete and win can lead to short-run behavior that is in the long run really unhealthy. And I think it's, it, the analogy is very similar. Sure, if you shoot up, you know, if you take the steroids, maybe you can run faster in this race. If you, you know, if you uh, put everything aside and work 60 hours a week, maybe you meet your deadline. But, you know, uh, surely the race that we're running is a longer run uh, competition and we need to be mindful of that. You say, in fact, and we'll end with this, but we need to renegotiate a new social contract or a new family contract. What would it include? Well, um, the policies that I've already mentioned, I think, are pretty central to it. I think um, uh, a better health care delivery system is probably at the, at the top of the list. That's such a huge concern for parents with kids who are not covered by insurance or who can't afford to pay for insurance. Uh, Better child care, better quality child care, more affordable child care that's an extension of the educational system. Uh, as a college teacher, I think we should be expanding on the other side, that we should be providing more public support for the f first two years of college in particular. It's so important to success in today's economy. And then paid family leave and paid sick leave uh, and less, uh, uh, fewer penalties on part-time work. Uh, that could allow people to back off a little bit and, and find a better balance. I think those are the really key elements. All right. Thanks so much for talking yeah, my with pleasure. us. It can lead to short-run behavior that is in the long run really unhealthy. And I think it's, it, the analogy is very similar. Sure, if you shoot up, you know, if you take the steroids, maybe you can run faster in this race. If you, you know, if you uh, put everything aside and work 60 hours a week, maybe you meet your deadline. But, you know, uh, surely the race that we're running is a longer run uh, competition and we need to be mindful of that. You say, in fact, and we'll end with this, but we need to renegotiate a new social contract or a new family contract. What would it include? Well, um, the policies that I've already mentioned, I think, are pretty central to it. I think um, uh, a better health care delivery system is probably at the, at the top of the list. That's such a huge concern for parents with kids who are not covered by insurance or who can't afford to pay for insurance. Uh, Better child care, better quality child care, more affordable child care that's an extension of the educational system. Uh, as a college teacher, I think we should be expanding on the other side, that we should be providing more public support for the f first two years of college in particular. It's so important to success in today's economy. And then paid family leave and paid sick leave uh, and less, uh, uh, fewer penalties on part-time work. Uh, that could allow people to back off a little bit and, and find a better balance. I think those are the really key elements. All right. Thanks so much for talking yeah, with pleasure. us. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.